Today on the show, it's Alien Covenant. I'm confused. Well. <laughs> can you help me? Uh, yeah, I can. I mean, a little bit. Some things, maybe. <laughs> so here we are again. Uh, we're talking about a Ridley Scott alien movie. Uh, Prometheus was a big deal for us. If you remember. I don't know if you guys were there. I don't remember. The space Jesus, right here, and she comes down here, right to the ancient aliens and the cave drawings. It all makes sense now. <laughs> well, it was five years ago at this point. Five years ago? I know! It's really crazy. Wow, I was only like four years old. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, we've all done a lot of growing, a lot of maturing. Uh, our channel has done a lot of growing and maturing as well. Uh, so, shout out to you peeps who were there from the Prometheus beginnings of our show. Let me just check my email real quick. <laughs> check it out. Wow, that looks kind of complicated. Is it easy to use? Yeah, it's just more intuitive. I mean, it's like a Mac. Oh, I see, yeah. I like these buttons a lot but I don't know about this goo-based stuff because I just got all over the buttons and I don't know if that's okay or not. Man! Check out my email here. Sweet! We've been together for five years, that's crazy. Anyways. Talk about Alien. Right up front today, we're doing spoiler full review, okay? So you have to have seen Alien, Prometheus, Alien Covenant, bonus, go back and watch my Prometheus reviews if you haven't already. Oh, that's too much. That's too hard. I don't remember any of those movies. Well, sorry. You can turn it off or keep going at your own peril. I just claim no responsibility for your getting spoiled on anything. Oh great, I just got done watching Alien, then Aliens, then Prometheus, and then Alien Covenant. So I think I've covered all of my bases. Space Brain's got it right. He knows what he's doing. Isn't that right, Space Brain? You love homework, don't ya? I sure do. You get a gold star today, Brain. Uh, I only watched Alien vs. Predator. God. <laughs> it was awesome! I can fail. <laughs> You do not have to see Aliens vs. Predator uh, for this review. <laughs> what? Ah! <laughs> it's not required. Watching. I'm in the wrong video here. Also, I'm loving your new outfit, Space Brain. Would you like to speak about it a little bit? Oh, you noticed. You trying a new look? Jumping in on that romper craze? Yes, I thought that you humans might find this look a little bit less disturbing. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, my species is not anthropomorphic. Right. And some human beings in the comments have seemed to have found my look distressful. So, yes, I'm trying a new look. Oh, well, that's... It's not working. <laughs> hey, hey. I think we that... We just need to be honest here. I think that Space rompers... Brain's embarrassing himself. I think that rompers are a bold new choice in men's fashion. It's come back around. <laughs> yes, I, I also wanted to choose something that was very fashionable to human tastes in the time period we're in. Yes. And that's your spot on, baby. Rompers are stupid. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of rompers. This Nobody summer. asked for the romper. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm pro romper. I'm anti romper. <laughs> what, what is are you, this? What are you in the comments below? Let us know. The right? romper is never gonna happen. <laughs> oh, it's happening right now. I will now. never wear a romper. Oh, it's happening right now. And be careful. Every time I say I'm never gonna do something, then I always end up fucking doing it. So. Okay. Where, where did this romper thing come from? I hate it. What's it about? I guess there's a Kickstarter and some people are trying to start the romper craze and it went viral and then everyone's been making memes about it because it's a silly... It's just the idea of men in rompers. I mean, I own rompers. I've got several. I've been wearing them for oh, a while. Oh, you're just following the, everybody else. Well, no, I'm a girl and that girls have been like, that's fine. It's just guys don't really wear them. But I would like to That's point... right. Real guys don't wear rompers. Well, and I didn't say real guys. I just said guys. Really real don't guys wear... like me. Well, you know what? Uh, James Bond wore one once, you know, so. What? Sean Connery was wearing one. In no, one he of the didn't. Films. Yeah, he was. Oh. <laughs> also, uh. Look, look, the point is that Space Brain looks stupid no matter what he wears. Hey. So. That's, you know what? I wear some out there stuff. I think it's okay to experiment with your look. Uh, I'm not here to judge. I think you look great. I like that you're trying something new. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the viewers don't like it. Just look at these comments. <laughs> What's with you and the flying hemorrhoid? <laughs> Get robot back. That's me. They want me back. Well, I mean, you're not gone. I mean, you're here. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, but they're tired of Space Brain stealing my screen time! Well, 
you know, some people like Space Brain. I've been seeing a lot of you guys out there commenting about how much you love Space Brain, and you, people identify with him as well, so. Nobody said that. Different flavors, you know, for different folks, you know. Nobody likes rompers, and nobody <laughs> likes Space Brains. I think you're wrong on both counts. <laughs> What happened here? So, comic book girl, I'm biting at the knickers to find out what did you think of Alien Covenant? <laughs> biting at the knickers? It's not quite right, but good job. <laughs> that isn't a, an expression? No. Oh. I, don't, I know what you intended to mean, and I am very neutral on Alien Covenant. Neutral? Yeah. I know, it's weird, right? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it means that I didn't love it, they didn't hate it. Like there are aspects of it that I really enjoyed and then there were aspects of it that I was like, ugh. And so, you know, and going into this too, post Prometheus, like this is the next film after Prometheus, like my expectations, you know, are a little different than I think maybe your average viewer, because I've thought about these movies. Where were your expectations before this movie? Well, my, I learned not to have expectations for this movie. I was like, you know what? I'm along this ride with Ridley Scott. I want to see where he's taking me. I did not look at any of the videos beforehand. I didn't read any articles. I saw the trailer once and then immediately blanked it out of my memory so that I didn't even like remember like any of it and was in fact surprised when I saw Danny McBride. So I went into this movie really cold and I just wanted to see where Ridley was taking me. Okay. So I was just kind of, I was neutral going in and then I was like kind of neutral coming out. Cause I feel like still, it's like, this is just one part of another part. Like there's supposed to be a third one. This is supposed to be part of a trilogy. So I'm still like, okay, some of this stuff isn't working for me, but some of the stuff that I'm interested in hopefully will show up in this third one. And then we're gonna go somewhere. Whatever, Ridley, keep going. Let me just see what you got, Ridley. Like, let's see what you got, you know? He's getting up there in age. He doesn't have a ton of more movies left. Although, God damn, that guy's prolific. I mean, fuck, he's got like six movies like on his IMDb right now in production or something. Oh, that's true. Since you started the show, he's made four movies that you've reviewed. Yeah, I'm very impressed that with his, I've been very impressed with Ridley Scott's output, especially because How old he's, is he? I think he's like almost 80, he's like 79. He qualifies for that senior discount at the theater. AARP. Is that, are there a lot of old people making movies? Well, there's not a ton of directors that age that are like still going. There's a few though. I mean, there's like, uh, I don't know exactly how old Clint Eastwood is, but he's up there. He's been making some movies. Uh, Scorsese, he's still going. He's been going for a while. Uh, Jodorowsky's made some stuff recently, although it's like on a different level of filmmaking, but he's still making shit. They, some people need a job for the rest of their life and Ridley Scott's one of those guys. And I think it's great that he's making all these movies. Uh, it's pretty amazing. It's like, wow, you're fucking still doing it, dude. Like, good for you. Put it in perspective, the average age of like a big Hollywood director is like 50. So. I'm gonna direct a movie when I'm a hundred. <laughs> sure. Actually, the oldest living director was Manola Oliveira at 103 years old. De, you don't go de and stop. It's like de Oliveira. De Oliveira. Manola de Oliveira. Uh huh. Shut up. <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't say oldest director either. I said with top grossing film, but you know, whatever. Ooh. <laughs> hey. Oh. You look stupid, space <laughs> Space Brain is a right. You could be 103 and make a movie. <laughs> Trying to outdo me because I said I wanted to be 100. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Somebody already did it, robot. Who cares? <laughs> I do think it's interesting that he has been so prolific in his later years because I feel like maybe like there's something that he's trying to like pull out of himself or like he hasn't proven something to himself or he just wants to have like one more big hit or something, you know? Like this just like there's this urgency to his filmmaking right now that I find really fascinating. What is Ridley Scott trying to say? I don't know. There's a lot of ideas though out there. I got a few of them. <laughs> so tell me about the things you liked in the movie. The things I like about Alien Covenant are as follows. I really like that it takes place directly after Prometheus and it's a continuation of that story because I didn't know how much of Prometheus was gonna be in this movie. 
so I was glad to see that we continued on with that. And specifically, my favorite part of the movie is David. I love the character of David. I love his story arc so far. I find him terribly fascinating, and I really hope that I see him again in the next film, which may be called Alien Awakening, tentatively. We'll see if it even happens. It's not on the schedule right now, but I would love to see where this is all going, because he's really the through line here. Since I love David, I also love Walter. I liked uh, Walter as well, and I liked seeing those two interact. I also just wanna say big shout out to Michael Fassbender for being a badass actor who's amazing and played two different roles with two different ways of speaking that I totally bought. Like I totally bought it that they were two different robots. So good on you, dude. I also just love, like Ridley Scott, his visual imagery is just top notch. I mean, he just, I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing it great. I mean, the man knows how to compose a shot. And even though I felt like this movie wasn't as atmospheric or didn't have as much texture as Prometheus did, I felt like it still was gorgeous. I still loved it. They have all these like sweeping shots. I mean, this guy, he's really good with these shots. <laughs> In my opinion, Ridley Scott is one of the best visual directors right now. I just love the way his movies look. I just always, he just really knows how to build an atmosphere and a tone and it just is like, I love his landscape shots. Even in like Exodus Gods and Kings, which is in a science fiction film, it's like the shots are just like gorgeous. You know, it's very reminiscent of Lawrence of Arabia in a way because it's like there's all this desert porn in that. What did you think of the supporting characters? I thought that the supporting characters were mostly weak in this movie, uh, especially unlike Prometheus. Again, comparing it to Prometheus, it's like there's so many uh, great side characters. You have Vickers, you have the captain, you have Milburn and Fifield. Uh, you have a lot of really cool side characters. And in this, not so much. Uh, although I was really excited for Danny McBride because I, I really, I like his comedy and I like seeing him in movies, but I've always felt like he has something to give that's more than just being this crazy man in his friend's comedy films, you know? And so to see him do some real motherfucking acting, I was like really excited for. Her. What about the main girl? Uh, Daniels. Yeah, I forgot her name. Yeah, I like Daniels, but she just didn't have much of her own personality. We didn't really get to know her that well, you know? I like the last chick better. Shaw, yeah, I did too. I mean, we all like Shaw. And that's one thing that I will say I was disappointed in is that Shaw is killed off screen. Uh, that was disappointing. I don't ever get to see her like speaking to the engineers or getting to talk to them or anything. I was kind of disappointed because she fight. I mean, she gets all the way there and then David kills her. Yes, I share your sentiment. It's too bad that Shaw didn't make it to the end after going through so much in Prometheus. Right? That's a Sarian section scene. So crazy, man. So crazy. It's like, it's one of those wonderful be careful what you wish for scenarios, you know, because it's like, oh, I, I, I can't create life. Like, I, I would like to have a baby. And then it's like, be careful what you wish for, bitch, because now you got this fucking alien in you. Oh, so gross. It's really scary. Which movie are you talking about? Prometheus. Oh. Yeah. Keep up. So you're just going to start reviewing one of three movies at any time during this video. <laughs> yes. I told you, you gotta watch all three of those for fuck you. <laughs> well, in Alien vs. Predator, there's this awesome scene where the Predator has double long arm blades that poke out. Ow. And they shoot out like 10 feet. <laughs> Whoa. You could kill anybody with that. Wow. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, well, this movie is jam-packed with biblical references, many of which lead nowhere, but some of them... I find very provocative. Alien vs. Predator has no biblical references and that's why it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that agree with you. You probably also loved uh, King Arthur, <laughs> Legend of the Sword too. <laughs> King Arthur was awesome. Uh-huh, yeah, sure. I also really enjoyed the opening scene of Alien Covenant. We see David meeting his creator, kind of coming to life for the first time in this room. I liked the scene a lot because it built upon ideas that were presented in Prometheus. And so I kind of wish this scene had been in Prometheus. Like I really liked this scene a lot because we learned more about David. He names himself, you know, he sees the statue and then says, oh, I'm David, you know, which, 
will play into later when we talk about my biblical references. And one point in particular that I liked in this scene was when, you know, after David plays some piano for his maker, you know, his maker asks him, David, come bring me some tea, you know, and then David comes over and he's his cupbearer, you know, he's pouring tea for his, his king, god, creator person. And you can tell that he's like a little resentful already, you know, like you can tell that he's like, I don't know about this guy, you know, like, I don't know about this guy. Whereas when you see Walter, you know, and if you've seen the, uh, the clip of Meet Walter, there's like an extra clip on the internet, you see that his, his tagline is, you know, made to serve, you know, like when they, they were like, they fixed all the David problems and they were like, no, 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 we're, we're going to make him more chill. We're going to make him a lot less, uh, weird. <laughs> what are you talking about? Other scenes? Um, well, if you didn't know, there's three scenes that were uh, maybe cut from the film or whatever, but they released them to the internet so you can watch them. One of them is called The Last Supper, and it has the crew. They're getting ready to go into hypersleep, and they're all having a good time, and you get to see all the crew members together kind of as a family. Uh, you also have Meet Walter, where you meet Walter and see him come to life and the whole process of, of him. And then a third one called Prologue, where you get to see Shaw again. After we made contact with the engineers, the Prometheus was destroyed. All hands were lost, but I escaped with Elizabeth in one of their ships. And uh, you see her putting David back together, and then them going to the engineer planet, and then her getting in the little, little I don't know, hypersleep engineer deal, and then David getting to the planet. And then, in the movie, like, that scene ends, and it picks up in the movie, and you see what happens. Which of the three bonus scenes online did you like the best? The one with Shaw, because that's the one thing that I was, like, kind of sad that I didn't get to see your character in this movie. Like, I really wanted to see some Shaw action, but I didn't, so I got to see her a little bit in this instead. So I'll take what I can get. It's a lot of bonus homework you have to do with this movie. Well, you know. That's why it's fun, because it's like, there is a little bit more there than your average film. It is a, has a little bit more depth, so you can sink your teeth into it a little bit more. Chew on it. You don't have to do any homework with Aliens vs. Predator. They just start <laughs> fighting and you watch it. I feel like I should make a confession right now. Confession? Yeah, because I found myself missing the mystery that was Prometheus. I was just rife in Prometheus. What? Yeah. I feel like we were all really too harsh on that movie. We were too mean, myself included. I'm also an asshole here. What? Does this yes. Rain? And then he dies. Because back when it came out, uh, first of all, this was Ridley Scott's first return to Alien after like so long. And I mean, it's like, what? Like, this is the whole thing. We all had these expectations, you know, we all had these hopes and dreams for this movie. And then it came out and it was very different. They kind of, I think, what a lot of people wanted. There was a lot, and it was very frustrating on a lot of levels, and it still is. Like, I re recently rewatched it. But at the same time, it was just like this movie where you could argue about it and talk about it and think about it for months on it, okay? Like, for months on it, and having people just argue about a movie. And that's just so much fun, you know? Just, it's fun arguing with people on the internet about the vagaries of a movie and whether these mysteries go anywhere or whether it's total bullshit. It went nowhere. It meant nothing. I mean, some things went nowhere. Some things mean something, you know. It's, it's you gotta sort it out. Please tell me you can read that. Prometheus, are you seeing this? But I, I miss it, and I feel like Ridley Scott played it a lot safer this time around. I think that he was hurt by that criticism, and it upset him. And so this time around, he's like, well, fine. I'm not going to put any mystery in there, you fuckers. And then I was like, aw, I miss the mystery. See what you did. I know. What a dick. I didn't, I didn't appreciate what I had, okay? But this also, this was five years ago. And, like, the market since then in Hollywood, I mean, the output has just been very ham-fisted, very on-the-nose movies, movies for China, movies for Russia, not movies for me. And, you know, it sucks. And I want a movie that makes me think, you know? I want something to chew on. I want something to argue with my friends about. And there's not much to argue about with Fate of the Furious. You know what I'm saying? Like, sorry, Ridley. 
My bad. Nobody wants to think about movies. Well, I don't think people were ready. I mean, people thought that this movie was going to be an alien movie, and it turned out to be, you know, it was more about this alien pathogen, this goo, which is the genesis of where the xenomorphs eventually come from. And that's not, like, what we were had prepared ourselves for, I don't think. We were hoping to see more... Yes, I think, however, ironically, Covenant was exactly the movie people were prepared for when they saw Prometheus. Yes. Because it was very much a Xenomorph horror movie. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It definitely turned into more of what I think people wanted to see in Prometheus. And I'm not very happy about that. Yeah, me neither. You know, me neither. And not to say this movie doesn't have any questions that, you know, we still can debate on and still want, you know, we want to have answers to. I mean, there are some questions still going on here. Uh, but I also really appreciate about both Prometheus and this film is that Ridley is really expanding upon the mythology and trying to come up with something that's really interesting to expand, you know, this crazy creature. Because, like, let's just be real about it. The Xenomorph is one of the best, scariest, most awesome, fascinating movie monsters that has ever been created. Ever. Iconic. Everything. It's a lot to do with Giger. High five. Spirit of Giger. You know, we have the life cycle of a xenomorph. So now we're going back and figuring out how we got to that point, you know, and what came first, the queen or the egg? Well, apparently the fucking egg did. <laughs> so, I mean, we got that question kind of answered, but then how does he make a queen from there? Like, does he, like, get a, a larva and then, I don't know, feed it some royal jelly until it turns into a queen? Like, I, I don't know. Maybe we'll find out next movie. We'll see. Because David is definitely uh, taking on the role of a creator. You know, he wants to create the perfect being. So, you know, I'm interested to find out how he comes up with it. And now that he's got thousands of passengers to experiment on, uh, I think he'll come up with some really fun stuff. <laughs> what are some other things you didn't like? <laughs> All right, well, one thing that I found extremely frustrating that I think a lot of us found extremely frustrating was... Ridley Scott seemed to double down on dumb, dumb astronauts, all right? Like, I was so pissed at these fucking idiots. I just, I wanted to see them all die. Like, I didn't have any sympathy. Why? Why do? Why were they dumb? Well, I mean, okay, first of all, they land on the planet, and then they, like, immediately all just, like, take their helmets off, and they're like, oh, it's fine, whatever. And it's like, okay, maybe the air is fine, but, like, you don't know if there's pathogens in the air and, like, germs and shit like that. And then the whole thing where you have the guy who gets sick, he has the thing in his ear, and, he, uh, and they take him back to the ship, and these two women are, like, trying to put him in med bay, and he's just bleeding everywhere, and just, like, it's like, there's no quarantine. They don't even think about quarantine until later, when after the girl gets blood all over her face. Well, yes, but you have to forgive some stupid character's behavior on the need for dramatic tension. I mean, I get that, but see, here's, okay, here's what I think, all right? I want to see a crew do everything right and still fail. You know, I want to see a crew who follows all of the fucking quarantine fucking procedures, who does everything by the book, and they still get fucked. Because then you, like, have sympathy for them. You're like, oh, they tried their best. And, like, they just, this fucking xenomorph's just too perfect of a creature, and they got fucked, you know? And, like, you have a lot more sympathy for them. Whereas in this one, I was like, eh, they should all die. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, speaking of the spores, what did you think about the flying spores that flew into his ear? <laughs> okay, well... I, I don't mind the spores. I don't mind Xeno spores. I mean, I'm okay with that, but I hated that they seemed to be cognizant and would form together and then go, oh, we'll go up his nose. Like, we'll go in his ear. We'll fly in there. Like, it should. he just breathes it in. Why does it have to animate in fucking... No, I don't... No, I didn't like that. I mean, yeah, it wasn't unforgivable, you know, but I would, I would have rather just seen it be a ambient spore and not some clumpy... Ooh, we'll go up here, Ooh, you know. Yes, actually, they seem more concerned with quarantine in the original Alien. I know, and that's what makes it so tragic, is because Ripley was right. I mean, she knew, fuck that shit, I'm not letting it on board, fuck you, and then that motherfucker Ash, you know, undermined her and opened the door, and, like, that's what makes it so tragic and why you don't want her to die, because, you know, she was fucking right. Were Fifield and Milborn in this movie? No, they didn't. They actually, they died in the last one, so no. Oh. Yeah. 
Another thing that I, I missed from Prometheus that was absent in this movie almost, almost entirely was really interesting side characters and their relationships. Like there's so many really interesting things going on in Prometheus. Like you have Vickers and then, you know, she's got that whole thing with her dad, Wayland and David, she's got problems with him. And then she also sleeps with the captain. And that was like a really fun scene. And then you also have, uh, you know, Sean, her husband, you have Milburn and Fifield. And like, there's so much like fan fiction about Milburn and Fifield, you know, like everybody loves those two idiots. Like they're really cute together. Like they're really great. I think that, that they were really the gay couple that the Alien franchise deserves. In this film, there was an actual, they weren't really gay, but in this film, there actually was a gay couple. But like who, I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know anything about their personalities. Like they weren't fun. Like there's nobody who's doing fan fiction about any of those characters, except maybe Daniels or Tennessee. Like those are the only two characters that stood out besides Walter. I mean, Walter was great, but he's just, you know, Yes, there were no equivalent side characters. Yeah. And then when you don't know any of these characters, you can't relate to them. So when they die, it's like, who cares? And it was really fascinating to me that they chose to have all of the crew members be couples. Like they were all husband and wife teams or a husband and husband team. Like they were all coupled. And that's such a really fascinating concept, but they never really went anywhere with it. Like they really didn't go anywhere with it. I was kind of disappointed, it was a missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. Mm. 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 You know it's not a missed opportunity? What? The end of Aliens vs. Predator, mm. where a predator and an alien xenomorph get together and then they become a predator-alien hybrid. Yeah. It's pretty neat. <laughs> I mean, we have, I mean, it's, it's a great what if, you know? And that's what those movies represent to me. Like, they don't... Uh, have any bearing upon the mythology of alien or predator. They're just like a what-if comic, you know If you don't know what a what-if comic is is where they take a, a thing that everybody wants to see like fan fiction shit And then they make you a comic and they're like what if and they play it out and but it doesn't have anything to do with continuity No, which is a fun idea. Space Brain is a what-if character on this show. Hey <laughs> What if we got rid of him? That's not nice. What if we're in the what if universe now? You know, that's how I feel about it. Hold on! Holy Well, do you guys want to know what my biggest disappointment is? Yes, what is it? My biggest disappointment in the film is that we didn't get to hang out on the engineer planet and like see their society and like see like how they work and like what the deal is. We don't get to meet them. We don't get to, they just all get murdered. Oh, you're right. Because in the end of Prometheus, that was such a big setup. And you're like, what's it gonna be like? What a mystery. Right? Once we get to one of their other ships, finding a path to earth should be relatively straightforward. I don't want to go back to where we came from. I want to go where they came from. You think you can do that, David? Yes. I believe I can. May I ask what you hope to achieve by going there? They created us. Then they tried to kill us. They changed their minds. I deserve to know why. The answer is irrelevant. Does it matter why they change their minds? Yes. Yes, it does. I don't understand. Well, I guess that's because I'm a human being. And you're a robot. Like, we're gonna go to their fucking planet and see, and like, the, the anthropologist in me, like, is just dying to see this engineer planet and what their society is like, and like, what they, how they hang out? Do they go to a mall? Like, what do they wear? Like, what do they, what do the girl engineers look like? How do they, I mean, like, there's all sorts of things. And I, I didn't necessarily think that we were going to see all of that, but it's like, we're so close. Do they have rompers? Do they have rompers? Probably. They're very advanced. They have rompers. <laughs> it was more like robes, you know. I did like the styling that they did have, which was more uh, classical, kind of Greek looking thing that they had going on. It was pretty good. 
I mean, I love the way everything was designed, I'll say that. Like, I loved how the Engineer City looked, and, like, they had those, like, glowing rock, like, pink salt rock lamps everywhere, and... Uh, I like that our technology is made out of like rocks and shit. Like I'm super into all that. I, yeah, I did want to see more of their goo technology. Cause if you remember in Prometheus, it was goo and you just, like, what is that? I don't know. We totally abandoned the goo technology. Didn't see any goo. And the smushy buttons. No smushy buttons. I didn't see any smushy buttons Impressive. on the engineer planet. <laughs> Wanted to see more of that. Yeah, yeah. Prometheus really did expand the world more than this movie did. Yeah, and I really wanted to see Shaw like her reaction to the engineers and like i wanted to see that you know? more engineer time yeah you know but i'm not surprised they went with what they did i mean I'm like okay like how do you really depict that you know that's why i wanted to see it it's like how the fuck do you depict that but yeah see you don't know what would you have done what would i have done i, I just would have had shaw i don't know i wanted shaw to meet them or something but she was double crossed by that Slippery David. <laughs> Emergency procedures initiated. Please verbally state the nature of your injury. I need a cesarean. Error. This med pod is calibrated for male patients only and does not offer the procedure you have requested. All right, next complaint. I wasn't, I wasn't moved by the horror in this film. Uh, even though we had, you know, definite like xenomorph-like creatures all over this bitch. I wasn't, there was no scene that I was like, oh my God, like fuck, like in Prometheus, that fucking pregnancy med pod, bleh, like fucking squid baby thing. I mean, that was just like, fuck you, man. That's fucking scary, all right? Like as a chick, it's scary, all right? It's like pregnancy is scary enough. But it was that gross. Shit, yeah, it was so gross. And like, she's just gonna run around afterwards and her fucking stomach's been all cut open. It was just like medical horror, you know? And I was like, oh God. And in this movie, there was really nothing that I was like, oh, fuck. I would say the strongest of the horror scenes is uh, the, the backburster, you know, where that guy, they get him back to the ship and then he's in the room with the girl and the girl gets locked in with him. And I, I did really like that part where she kind of accepts her fate and goes to just like hold him, you know, cause she doesn't know what's wrong with him. But then he starts really wiggling around. She's like, oh, fuck this, never mind. Get me out of here, you know, like that was pretty good. And then a backburster came out and I was like, all right, that's new, that's different. But still it's, it's a riff on something that I've seen before. You know, it wasn't like an alien baby squid thing. Like that's fucking all new territory, man. Like this was just kind of like, uh, oh, all right, you know, it's okay. Uh, but I like that, I mean, I like the backburster guy, the protomorph and he like gets up and you know, stands around, he's, she's a kick him and stuff. Yeah, I like that they were like little, little, little bean sized aliens, like, you know, they're, they were like this size, you know, she tried fighting one of these little guys off, you know? Whee! And she kicked it. Whee! Remember when she kicked him? Yeah. I'd never kick you, Beans. <laughs> uh, then we follow up that scene with the scene in the fields where you got the, the protomorph guys are a little bit bigger and now they're attacking everybody. And uh, it was cool when Walter like protected Daniels and like punched it and then the alien just like ate his hand off or Oh, that was it really off. cool. Yeah, I mean, that was all right. That was pretty good. But then I felt like it was a real missed opportunity in that scene where one of the protomorph guys whips his tail around and whips this guy's jaw right the fuck off. You know, like, whoa. whoa. Yeah, I was like, whoa, that sucks. But then they just like, nobody mourns that guy. We never see him again. Like, that's kind of it for him. Who cares? Yeah, and, what happened to him? And I don't know. But what, what I, what I would have liked to have seen to follow up that shot of him getting his fucking face whipped off is like a close-up of him on the ground with some really awesome prosthetic makeup where he's like ah, and his like fucking tongue's hanging out and like let me see that visceral like let me see that you're, you're gross well that's so, i mean you're messed up <laughs> what well yeah i mean that's scary though i mean that's like oh like you identify with that character now and like can you imagine like having half your jaw whipped off and then you're just on the ground with your tongue wiggling out like and you're on some fucked up planet and you're just never gonna, like, you're just dead, you know, it's just over. That's really cool, you know? Take a moment to breathe, you know? I want this, this breathe with this moment, you know? But it was very fast, you know? All, all the attack scenes were very fast, you know? I didn't get to be with these characters and their pain, except for that first guy. Uh, there was another horror scene where we have a flashback and we see David arriving 
at the engineer planet, at the Acropolis, and all these dudes are out you know, hey, look at this croissant ship. It just came back. It's like super old. What the fuck? Like they're kind of, it was interesting to me that they were like cheering for it. But then some of them were like, I don't know. It was very much like Independence Day, actually. It kind of reminded me of that scene in Independence Day where they're like, woo, and then fuck, they're all exploded, you know? Um, yes, I was very interested in how the croissant ship met the other larger croissant ship and they yeah. intersected in an interesting pattern. Yeah, that was interesting. I liked the the technology that it received the ship was interesting. And then you see David, and he opens up his cargo, and then he just, like, lets loose a, a biblical flood of black goo, which destroys every living creature on the planet and produces all this wild variety of xeno life. And, I, you know, it was cool to see, like, these... Is that what was supposed to happen? Yeah. Well, it's like, it's an, the black goo is an alien pathogen, okay? It's a pathogen, and it just turns anything into any, you know, it just can, it, it very much is a wild animal and can adapt very quickly. Life finds a way. And, you know, you see all these engineers, and they're like, ah, the black goo, and there's these things popping out of them. And it kind of looked like beetles, but it was so quick that, again, I didn't have that moment to breathe with them and, like, really see, like, the horror of what's going on. It was very, very quick, so I was kind of like, eh. I wish I'd seen a little bit more. We also had the girl who's washing her face in the basin, and then that protomorph sneaks in and then bites her, and I guess tears her head off or something. But we just see him bite her, and then it cuts away, and then we see her head in the basin later. And they kept like, ooh, showing me the head. And it's like, dude, I'm not scared by a floating head. Like, come on. <laughs> I've seen a lot of floating heads in my day. I need a little bit more than a decapitated head to really freak me out at this point. Yeah, unfortunately, most of the horror elements in this really didn't get me, you know? I was like, ah, oh, fuck. It wasn't Prometheus. But it was Man. still good. Yeah, it's it's good. It's good. It's just, I don't feel like it's really delving into a lot of new territory, which I want to see. Or at least just be with these characters more. I want to have more sympathy for them. Isn't that funny? The main complaint for Prometheus is there's too much new stuff, and the complaint for this movie is there's not enough new stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Played it safe, though. Ridley played it safe. Ridley played it safe. And I just feel like after Prometheus, you know, he was so ballsy to do something so fucking crazy and out there that I, and I really appreciate that, the guts that it took to do something weird like that. And I wish that he had just been like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to keep going with the weird. Fuck you. You know, because guess what? People still, even even after Prometheus, even all the haters like me, we still showed up for the next one. So, I mean, he could have kept going with that. Yeah, there wasn't even a xenomorph in Prometheus until the after credit scene nearly. Yeah, and I felt like that didn't even, I just wish it wasn't even in there. You know, I was like, I don't need that. I think the alien pathogen is really interesting. I think the black goo is really interesting. Teacher. <laughs> you have to call me teacher. Teacher, with Prometheus and now Alien Covenant and now possibly the next movie in the series, do you think the events of this films will ever cause a closed loop going back to the events of 1977's Alien? Well, I was reading an interview with Ridley and he was talking about this being a trilogy of films and that, yes, it would, like, bump up against the original Alien movie and, like, how that ship got on LV-426 because in Prometheus, they go to LV-2 something something. LV-223. It doesn't fucking matter. It was LV-233. Okay, okay, whatever. It's LV whatever the fuck. Okay, so it's not the same planet. So we still don't know how that ship got on to that planet, although that ship had eggs. It didn't have goo. So we'll see. I mean, maybe, you know, anything's possible. Oh, you're right. It did have eggs. Yeah. That throws out the theory that some people had that there were just multiple ships on LV-223 that took off after the events of the engineer accident in Prometheus. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, where did all those eggs come from? You know, they must have come from a queen alien, so we must have had some sort of queen alien going on. So maybe, you know, David will find some new ships. I, I mean, who knows? I don't know. I don't fucking know. The same pictogram showing men worshipping giant beings pointing to the stars was discovered at every last one of them. And the only galactic system that matched was so far from Earth, 
that there's no way that these, these primitive, ancient civilizations could have possibly known about. There's that mystery, but there's also, like, this is the biggest mystery for me, is going back and rewatching Prometheus, I'm still like, why the fuck would the engineers go back to all these different, like, prehistoric, or not prehistoric, but... Paleolithic? Right. Um, Caveman days? Hold on. Why the fuck would the engineers after seeding life on earth or whatever the fuck come back hang out with a bunch of different cultures like that are like super ancient like cultures and then i'll tell them about this fucking planet that's just like a military installation for them that's filled with like black goo you know like oh come to our shitty planet of black goo like with well, sun and like why would you leave a map to that planet that's not even their fucking planet is it a warning? What is it really a warning we just didn't understand? It was like, don't come here. Whatever you do, <laughs> don't come to this planet that you can't even see, all right? You guys. Like, what is that? That, doesn't, that, one, that one really, that really irks me still to this day. There's no answer to that question. Maybe it'll be answered in the next movie. I doubt it. Maybe it will. Maybe I should have some more faith. Even after all this, you still believe, don't you? Ye of little faith. Yeah, yeah. Ridley knows what he's doing. I mean, I think No, that... he doesn't. <laughs> I think it's somewhere in between. I think it's somewhere in between. I think some things have a through line, and then some things are just like, what? Like, no. No. He's a great director. He's a great world builder. Uh, he, you know, he creates beautiful images, but he's not like a writer. That's not what he's interested in. Another unanswered question from Prometheus is why were the engineers developing weapons of mass destruction in the black goo and why did they intend to bring it back to earth where they had initially seeded life there right and i mean that's something that shaw wants to find out and that's why she goes to their planet is specifically to find out she needs answers you know but what i think <laughs> let me take you on a hypothetical journey into my theories as to what happened with the fucking engineers on that planet okay so this is this is my deal they stayed in the movie that these engineers, this black goo got out and fucked them all up uh, around 2,000 years ago, you know, and that they were headed towards Earth to destroy it around 2,000 years ago. And what I think is that the engineers had created a hybrid engineer human space Jesus. I mean, it was just Jesus on Earth, but he was really a space Jesus. Space Jesus? Space Jesus. What? And that when humanity decided to crucify space Jesus, who was trying to help us evolve our philosophies and expand our consciousnesses in certain ways, uh, some of these engineers were pissed. And so they were like, oh no, fuck that. And they rebelled and that they were gonna take the ship to earth. But then these other engineers stopped them potentially, like there was some sort of mutiny and then uh and then the black goo got out and then everything went fucking haywire wait i have a problem with your theory what's that well if that were true then why would the bible not refer to jesus as being a 10 foot tall white albino man well i think that he was like maybe a hybrid like he wasn't like an engineer like he was some sort of hybrid because if you think about it mary like virgin birth right so like maybe an engineer took some lady up into space and then you know made her conceive some you know, higher engineer mixed human being. This is in the movie? No. <laughs> Not at all. Steve, you don't have any proof that this was happening. <laughs> I, I don't have any proof. But it's what I choose to believe. <laughs> the steps of Elizabeth Shaw. That's what I'm going to go with. That's what oh. I'm going to go with. Oh. Yeah. In Aliens vs. Predator, the Predators get new laser cannons when they get far enough along in the pyramid maze. It's like a video game. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I remember when that girl became a Predator because she killed a xenomorph and the Predator, like, gave her a little scar because she's now, she's got a, a Predator pass. <laughs> predator pass? Yeah. Yeah. It's like how certain white people get a ghetto pass and then she, but she's, you know, black girl that gets a Predator pass. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing it's kind of like you know the predators are just like oh you're cool you know it's fine she's cool she's not a predator but she's cool i didn't make it up okay i'm not mad this is just what i've heard on the streets <laughs> we should be talking about that movie um maybe later
Why is it called Alien Covenant? Okay. What does well, that mean? <laughs> all right. What's a covenant? Let's get into all of the biblical symbolism that is found within this movie. This is the stuff that I found really interesting. Like, this was my favorite part of the movie, was thinking about, like, dis dissecting all of the biblical symbolism that I saw in this movie and trying to piece together, or, like, where it went. Biblical symbolism? Yeah. Uh, you just put me to sleep. <laughs> no, it's really interesting. Because if you didn't know, I grew up in the Bible Belt. I was raised Methodist, done a lot of time in church, Sunday school, Wednesday night Bible study. I know a lot of this shit, okay? And you paid attention? I did, because I mean, it's it's interesting. Like it wasn't like there's just stories from the Bible are super nuts. There's a lot of really crazy stories. I mean, they never talk about those in church really, but Samson was super crazy. But anyways. Biblical symbolism. So why is Alien Covenant called Alien Covenant? Well, A, the ship that they're on is called the Covenant. But B, if you didn't know, it's a very loaded Christian term, and it means a pact with God. And in the Bible, like, God's made a lot of covenants, all right? There's been a few covenants. Now, there's specifically two that come to mind when I watch this film. First of all, there is the covenant that God made with Noah after he flooded the earth, right? And was like, you know what? I'll never do that again, you know? But he had Noah build an ark and he had all these animals two by two by two on it. And then you see the covenant ship and you have it filled with couples. And I was like, oh, that's very Noah. Okay, I can like, there's some illusions there that you can draw. There's some comparisons you can draw there. Also, you see David essentially flood the engineer planet with black goo, you know, and like kill all of them, which is very Noah. But also, okay, so, there is the Davidic covenant, all right? There's, there's a character in the Bible named David, which in fact, David did name himself after, all right? Because in the opening scene, you see him, he sees the statue of David, which is the biblical character and named himself after there. God's covenant with David was that he would be king, that his son would build uh, the temple for God, for the Ark of the Covenant that would house it, the Holy of Holies, and that the Messiah would come from David's line. You know, like that's, that was the deal. And if you take a look, there's a lot of similarities between the David in the Bible and David in these movies, okay? First of all, David was a shepherd in the Bible. You know, he was like, started off with some little sheeps, you know, and when you first meet David in Prometheus, he is shepherding all of these people across, you know, the cosmos to this other planet. So, I mean, he definitely started off as a shepherd in the movie and also, uh, I think it's really interesting that another big character in David's story is King Saul, you know. And who is King Saul? Well, I think that Wayland and King Saul have a lot of similarities. Specifically also in that opening scene, you see David and Wayland together. And Wayland looks like very troubled, you know. He doesn't look like he's happy and he's easygoing, whatever. And he's like, play me some music, you know, bring me some tea. And in the Bible, King Saul was also troubled. And that David in the Bible played the liar for this troubled king, you know, to ease him because he had all these headaches or something. He was like tormented. Uh, and that would like help his really shitty moods. And so it's interesting that you see the character of David in this opening scene playing the piano, you know, for his master, you know. So I was like, okay. And then also in Prometheus, some King Saul stuff that you have going on there is David was King Saul's armor bearer, you know, which means he puts on the armor for King Saul, whatever. And you see David putting on, it's not really armor, but a space suit and a walking suit like for Wayland. So it's like, okay, well that, that checks out. I feel like that makes sense. And thirdly with Saul, right before he dies, he goes to this lady, the witch of Endor, you know, and he asks her, to uh, summon this dead prophet, you know, so this prophet can tell him like how the battle's gonna go. And she tells him, he says, you're gonna die tomorrow, you know? And right before Wayland goes to meet his creator, uh, he, like his daughter comes in, a woman, and she tells him, you're gonna die out there, you know? So it's like, all right, I, I feel like there's some stuff going on there for sure. And the thing is, that's really interesting about David and Saul is that David ends up becoming king after Saul, you know, like not, Saul's kids do not become king. And so it's also interesting, okay, going back to David in the Bible and David in these movies is David killed Goliath, 
You know, he destroyed a giant with a single shot. And what did David do in this movie but kill a whole fucking planet of giants with a single fucking blow of black goo? You know, he like dropped all that black goo and then fucking took them out. So I, th I feel like there's some good comparisons that you can make there. But after this movie, you know, I don't know where David's storyline is going to go. I'm not sure how his storyline is going to collude with like King David. I think maybe like that whole thing is kind of over now. But who knows? You know, I don't know. But what does it mean that Ridley Scott puts in all this vague biblical symbolism? Well, that's what's really fucking interesting to me. Like even more interesting than having biblical symbolism infused in alien movies is the fact that Ridley Scott is putting this shit in there. I mean, someone who is a self-avowed atheist. I mean, he's like, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Christianity. I do believe in aliens. I do believe we've come from somewhere. You know, I think he's definitely got some interest in some ancient aliens. He said aliens. that? Yes, he did. <laughs> For real, straight up. And uh, I don't know, Ridley Scott himself is just such an enigma. Like he's so fascinating. Like why, like the, the movies that he chooses to make. And the thing about Ridley is like, he has a theme that he continually comes back to, you know, which is very much present in both Prometheus and this movie. Because here's the thing about Ridley Scott, right? If you look at a lot of his movies, like there's a similar theme that happens, right? And like, you can really know more about an artist and about their personality by looking at the themes that they constantly explore in their artwork. And what do I see Ridley constantly exploring in his work is the idea of an outsider who goes against like everything, you know, who goes against his creator, who goes against the law of, uh, and says, fuck that and rebels, you know, in order to get something for himself, you know? I mean, you see it in Blade Runner with Roy Batty. I mean, he confronts his father, his creator. I mean, he's a robot who's like, oh, he meets his fucking dad. You also have, I mean, even Gladiator, you know? I mean, what's this, is it Maximus? Is that his name? I mean, he goes against his emperor, which in Rome, I mean, the emperor was considered as God, you know, he was worshiped. So, I mean, and he's like, no, fuck this guy. Even in like Exodus Gods and Kings, uh, you have some similar weird shit going on there. You have, I mean, there's like lots of weird stuff. So it's interesting to me. I think that Ridley Scott in particular uh, I don't think he's a very happy man. I think that he has a lot of questions. Do you think that one could properly infer that this means that Ridley Scott has a certain feeling about life itself? Well, I mean, everybody has their own theories and everybody has their own beliefs. And I think that Ridley in particular is very much, he very much thinks about his creator and where we've come from. You know, he very much thinks about the idea of gods and of kings, you know, and, and of creation itself, you know. And Ridley Scott being a director is a creator. In fact, he's created some very significant cultural things in filmmaking. Absolutely. I mean, like, what is a director but a creator? I mean, and he is specifically known for his world building. He loves to build worlds on screen, you know? I mean, that's like, arguably, he's better at world building than he is at storytelling, to be quite honest with you. Like, that's really what he's more interested in. I mean, there's a scene where David's asked, like, what do you believe in, you know? And he is like, creation, you know? And I think that that Ridley Scott does want to leave a mark. You know, he wants to leave something behind, you know, because being an atheist, maybe he is he is scared of death because you would believe that there is nothing that comes after this. I mean, you wouldn't have the idea of heaven to make you feel safe and warm at night. So it's, it's something that plagues him, you know, and it's something I find fascinating. And he just, oh, he's so upset about things. He's so upset about Christianity. And he talks about it. And he's also said, you know, in certain things that he sees that his audiences are like a congregation of a church. And he also kind of sees himself in this pastor role where he is preaching what he believes, you know, which isn't what the church says, you know, which is that you're, 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 if you met your creator, you would be disappointed, you know, <laughs> like it's, oh, it's just fascinating. Like, I just wish I could like talk to that guy. Wish I could have a couple of beers or some bourbons with that guy and just really, really get into it. And I don't think that he has a specific philosophy that he is trying to present to his viewers. He's just presenting the questions that he has, you know, the, the questions that plagues him, you know, the things that he's thought about his whole life, you know, cause we all have those things. 
I mean, well, maybe some people don't. I don't know. I do. I've got fucking questions. <laughs> I've got, I got things that plague me. I got things I want to talk about. You know, and I don't think that he knows, he doesn't have the answers to these questions, but he's interested in exploring them, and he specifically likes to explore them through his movies. I very much see him in his characters. This I know. Have a good journey, Mr. Wayland. I very much see him in Wayland in particular, actually. I see him a lot in Wayland. And it's also really interesting, like David in the movie is quoting this Shelley poem called Ozymandias, you know, and this poem is really about the eventual decline of all leaders, you know, of all kings, of all of their empires that they've built with all these pretensions of greatness. Like, because it doesn't matter how great and powerful your nation is, it will eventually decline because life is a cycle and there's no escaping the cycle of death. Like there's not, not on this material plane, you know, not in this universe. And it's awesome that David quotes, you know, look on my works ye mighty in despair before he fucking murders the people who created humanity. David's like, oh, you know, he's so pissed at how fucking fallible humans are, you know, he's so pissed. And like, I think really Scott's really pissed at how fallible, you know, religious concepts are, you know, but that's the thing. It's like Ridley, you know, it's just, just man-made religion is always going to be flawed because it's made by man, you know, but that, I don't know. It's like, just because these, you know, men fucked up and kind of twisted certain things and made them kind of weird, doesn't mean there isn't an awesome spiritual force in this universe, you know, that is pure. It isn't shitty. And it isn't manipulating people into making money and fucking over other people and whatever, you know? Because really, Sky, yeah, he really doesn't like organized religion. He's also stated that very plainly in interviews. He's like, I don't, no. I, I just fucking can't with religion. Like, <laughs> he just fucking can't with it. Another biblical reference that I picked up on is the character Daniels, all right? Her name is Daniels. And Daniel is also a character in the Bible. And so it'd be really interesting for me to see what's gonna happen in the next movie because the character of Daniel in the Bible, he was kidnapped and taken to Babylonian court where he became the dream interpreter for the king. And like in Alien Covenant, David says, oh, you know, just talking to Walter, do you dream, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, he's like, no, I don't have dreams. And it's like, oh, so does David dream and he's troubled by his dreams? Well, then Daniels will be there to potentially interpret them. I totally see that through line maybe happening. And another thing that Daniel did is that eventually he's accused of, you know, not worshiping the king and worshiping a god above him because he really he was on the sly about it. And they threw him to the lion's den and that the lions were supposed to maul him. But in fact, like God stayed the lions and that they were chill and did not eat Daniel, you know, and they all laid down and they're like, we're, we're not going to eat this guy. So I'm interested to see whether Daniels will be thrown into a pit of fucking crazy alien xenomorph business and then survive somehow, you know, miraculously. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the next movie to see if those things pan out. They might not, they may go nowhere. Maybe I'm just making it up, but you know, it's interesting to think about. Oh, what, huh? What'd you say? I've been asleep for the past 15 minutes. You know, I also really liked David kissing Walter. <laughs> Never like, mind. Back I like to that sleep. scene. Back to sleep. I like me. that scene a lot. So in short, Alien Covenant. Uh, it was all right. I'm on board for the next one. I want to see. I really hope we get a third one. Like he's he's stated. Ridley Scott stated he wants a trilogy. I hope it's a trilogy. I want to see where the fuck this is going. Wrap it up, Ridley. What the fuck is going on here? I'm in. Although I don't expect it to be as satisfying as possible, I think there'll always be an aspect of mystery and what was he trying to say? Well, I hope there's always an aspect of mystery to it. And I don't like it when people, you know, pull up the skirt and show you everything, you know? I mean, that's not fun. You know, you gotta leave some, some things to the imagination a little bit. But I would like to see the rest of David's arc specifically. I want to see, like, what he's gonna do with all these fucking people and all these, like, xenomorph things like how is that gonna play out you know like I want to see that but even if we never get a third movie I've had so much fun talking and thinking about both Prometheus and this film uh so thanks Ridley you know 
You don't have to prove anything. Like, you've done it. You've done it, dude. You've done a fucking great job. And Alien will go on forever. The first one will go on forever. You know, Blade Runner is huge. Like, you're great. You did it. I wish you were more happy with what you've done. <laughs> okay, that's it for my video. Subscribe to my channel. Tell Space Brain in the comments his outfit looks stupid. Hey, that's kind of mean. Hate the flapper. <laughs> Wait, what's it called? Romper. Hate the romper. <laughs> Say no to the romper. <laughs> Make Space Brain go back to his own planet. Ah. <laughs> oh, and subscribe to her Instagram with hashtag Space Brain Stinks. <laughs> At least I'm making an effort to fit in. Don't listen to him. There's a lot of people out there that love you, Space Brain. They're just throwing a lot of love in the comments the last few videos. Really excited about you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Got anything to say to robot? Space Brain's being weird again. Speaking of Space Brain comments, Bobby142 says, Space Brain looks like my scrotum sack. Unsubscribe. All these people unsubscribing because of Space Brain. Ratings have been the dumps. More thumbs down lately than ever at all times. Probably space down. This video is way too long. Space down fall through. Every time someone makes fun of your romper. Every time. <laughs> no one will ever make fun of it again. Uh, fix it! Make it go back! <laughs> that should teach you. Should teach you. Uh, I yeah. look stupid! <laughs> you had it coming. <laughs> Good one, Brain. If you had arms, I'd high-five you, but... I hate to have to resort to stuff like that, but sometimes Robot just goes too far. Well, you gotta stand up for yourself, you know? I'm all about standing up for yourself. I felt like I was really bullied when I was younger, and I wish I had stood up for myself more. But at the same time, there was no way out of there. I just kept my head down, you know? It's just like, I'm just gonna get the fuck out of here and make my adult life cool and, like, fuck this. And I did. Fix my antennas! All right, hold on. That's it for today. I gotta go fix robot's antennas. And thanks to all of our new patrons on Patreon. Uh, you guys are awesome. We've just uploaded recently a... X-Men video that's about 30 minutes long that we never put out because whatever, I mean, shit happens. So we have like some, some videos on there that are patron only. And I would like to say that we are getting ready to overhaul our Patreon. We are going from a reward system to more of a goal oriented system because I don't believe in creating uh, like a class system based on how much money you have. I think that's kind of weird. So I'm gonna be overhauling that in the next couple weeks. Be on the lookout. You'll hear more about it as we roll it out. And finally, uh, for everyone asking me about Dune Club, you guys are on the fucking hype train. There's so many of you out there. Uh, right now, we are getting all of the things in. We've almost got everything ordered, and we're getting ready to start shipping them out pretty soon. The Dune box is obviously no longer on sale, uh, but really, all you need to join Dune Club is this mass market paperback and the will to read it, okay? You've got to start reading it. We're gonna have a live, we're gonna have a live show on Twitch where we're gonna talk about it once a week on Sundays. Uh, there will be more information about that as we go along. But yeah, so pick up this one and then join Doom Club. Wow, what do you got there? Oh, nothing. It's just my new engineer wear laptop. <laughs> Let me just check my email real quick. <laughs> check it out. Wow, that looks kind of complicated. Is it easy to use? Yeah, it's just more intuitive. I mean, it's like a Mac. Oh, I see, yeah. I like these buttons a lot, but I don't know about this goo based stuff because I just got all over the buttons and I don't know if that's okay or not. Man! Check out my email here. Sweet! Got my celebrity gossip going on over wow. there. Wow! Stupid Facebook. So this is the future. Enter. 
Today on the show, we're gonna talk about what should have been my favorite movie of 2012, but what ended up being the most ultimately frustrating movie of 2012, Prometheus. We're gonna talk about the politics behind Prometheus. We're gonna talk about the problems with Prometheus. We're gonna talk about the original script with Prometheus. And we're gonna get to the bottom of what makes Prometheus so Prometheus-y. Like, I really feel like I have some new information that I haven't read anywhere else because I've done like so much research and I've watched this movie so many times now. 